I'm pumped because we're wrapping up this series that we've been doing in here. If you're just joining us, just checking us out, we're wrapping up a series today that we've been doing in here on prayer, and it's called The Book of Prayers. And if you ever get into the Bible, you will notice that there are a lot of different prayers in the Bible. And what we've been doing is we've been taking some time to kind of say, okay, how can we go deeper in our relationship with God? How can we connect with God in a new way, in a different way? And and, and maybe for some of us in this room, maybe your connection with God, you know, you kind of feel like, ah, it's, I just don't know how to do it. It's not for me. I don't even know what to say sometimes. Well, the Bible is full of great prayers. Prayers, great patterns of prayers that you can involve into your personal time with God where, where you can connect with him in a great way and grow in, in a different way than maybe you thought I had to do it a certain way, but there are all sorts of different ways that you can connect with God. My wife, I think she knocked it out of the park last week. She got up here and talked about, yeah, you can clap. It's all good. Yeah, she got up here and talked about just different ways that you can creatively connect with God and that you can connect with God in, in nature. You can connect with God just out on a run. You can connect with God with a prayer guide that one of the things that we have in a pattern. There's so many different ways that you can connect with God and we just encourage you to, to pick one and, and start growing in your relationship with God because God wants to grow with you and be close with you. Our theme verse for this whole series has been found in Ephesians chapter 6 and it says this. It says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions. So let me stop right there. Not just at church. Don't just pray. Don't just pray when you're really desperate and you need God to do something. Like, don't just pray before the meal. Don't just pray before you go to bed or tuck your kids into bed. It's saying, listen, pray regarding everything. Pray about anything you're walking through, anything you're dealing with. Before you go into that meeting, before you take that phone call, before you send that text message, come on, somebody. Like, like pray on all occasions and let God really speak to you and guide you in what you're supposed to do. But then it says this, it says, with all kinds of prayers and requests. That's what I said earlier. The Bible is full of different prayer patterns and different things that, that you can connect with, that you can uh, take into your own time with God, where you can really feel like at you, at when you're done with praying, you're done spending time with him, you really can feel like I've touched heaven. I've really made a difference. My prayers matter today. I didn't get distracted and see a bird or a chipmunk or something and think, oh my gosh, where was I? Like you can connect with God and really feel like there was a difference. I don't know about you, but when I grew up, I grew up in a, a church that was a great church. I love my, my church upbringing that I grew up in. Maybe some of you didn't grow up in church. Don't it's okay. We we'll love you because you didn't probably get messed up in the early church days. But anyway, but uh, when I grew up, like sometimes there was some weird prayers that people would pray or some scary prayers. Anybody ever experienced a scary prayer? Like somebody praying over you and you're like, what are you praying right now? Like my stepmom used to pray this prayer over me every night before I would go to bed. She would say this. She'd say the whole prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. Come on, somebody ever heard this one? I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I'm like, what? What are you, what are you saying right now? Now? What? What do you? My soul? Like I want my soul. And she goes. And if I should die before I wake, I was like, Hang on, wait, 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 wait. Like, like that's. Wait, wait, you know something I don't know right now? Like if I should die in my, I don't want to die. Now I'm gonna stay up all night because I don't want to die in my sleep. Like, are you serious right now? And I pray the Lord my soul to take. I'm like, Oh my goodness, I'm out. Get me out of this prayer. I don't want to do this. Prayer. Like that one creeped me out. Like thanks, thanks, stepmom. Now I'm gonna have nightmares for the rest of my life. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And sometimes we can pray some prayers growing up. We can we can get, understand some things. And maybe we don't get them. We don't like them. It kind of creeped us out. Or maybe maybe there's moments in our life where we just don't know what to pray or we don't know how to pray. And, and it leaves us in a place where we're really not connecting with God just simply because we don't know what to do. Or maybe our, our history has not led us to a great place where we can connect with God. And in this series, we've really been hoping and praying that that you can connect with God in a way that, that you can really relate to him and he can relate to you. And God made you, he designed you, he put you together. And so he wants to connect with you in a way that you're gonna get the most out of it. God doesn't want to be distant from you, but he wants to be close with you. Uh, one of our verses that I wanna look at today is found in Luke chapter 11. It says this, that one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord... Teach us 
to pray. Now let me stop right there for a second, and it's important to, for us to understand this, that a lot of you know that Jesus had these 12 disciples that followed him around for about three, three and a half years during his ministry. And these Jewish boys that followed him around, they grew up memorizing prayers, reciting prayers. Like that was part of their Jewish education. They had to learn these things. They had to learn these specific prayers. And then one day they saw Jesus praying in the garden and they said, whoa, wait a minute, hold up, wait a minute. Like what you're doing over there, Jesus, we never were taught that. Like, that looks like something good. That looks like something that I really want to have in my life. I never have seen it like that. Like, all the prayers I do are different. But Jesus, teach us that. Teach us what you are doing over there. And I love it because the Lord responds, Jesus responds with what we know as the Lord's Prayer. He responds with this whole idea of, he goes, let me show you what I was doing over there. And he gives the, the disciples the Lord's Prayer. He goes, hey, when you're praying, pray, pray like this. And what Jesus was doing is he wasn't saying, hey, this is how you have to pray. He wasn't saying, listen, like, I want you to recite the words that I'm saying right now. But I believe with all my heart, God, Jesus was giving us an outline and helping us to understand some of the different areas that he was dealing with while he was praying. I think over time, maybe you've heard of the Lord's Prayer. Maybe you've recited it at one time or another. Maybe you've heard it at a funeral or in a church setting or a wedding or something. But it seems like over time, it can lose a little bit of the luster behind it. It's like it's just going through the motions. You're just reciting something, but you lost the meat. You lost the flavor of it. And, and my hope today is to kind of break it down a little bit so we can understand it better. We can apply it to our life better. And honestly, out of all the prayers that we've been talking about this whole series, this is one of my favorites because I didn't understand earlier in my life what Jesus was doing here. And when I began to understand it, when I began to apply it to my life, all of a sudden it took my prayer life to a whole new level because it wasn't just reciting something. It actually had meaning and substance behind it. So Jesus answers the, these guys, these disciples. He says, hey, teach just to pray, and he teaches them the Lord's Prayer. And in Matthew chapter 6, he kind of goes into it. He says, okay, this is what I was saying. He goes, our Father in heaven, but then there's a comma there. So he's like, I was dealing with that for a little bit. Then I, then I moved on to something else. Hallowed be your name. We don't use the word hallowed too much anymore. But he says, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A lot of us maybe have heard that prayer before. Maybe you've recited it at some time in your life. But I believe with all my heart that Jesus was kind of giving us an outline of how to work through our prayers to really actually make a difference, actually connect with God in a way where you can step away from your time with God where you say, wow, I really felt like my prayers made an impact today. I really felt like I touched heaven. I really felt like it was a good time with God. And I believe as we break it down, this can be something that you can apply into your own time, your own life. You can do it in five minutes. You can do it in 15 minutes. You can take more time on it if you'd like to. But it's something that's so simple that you could work through that I believe that at the end of it, you say, wow, I'm so glad I did that. So let's, let's break it down today. The first thing that Jesus says in this whole Lord's Prayer is he says, our Father in heaven. That's the first phrase that he says. And so if you're taking notes today, I'd love for you to write this down. Number one is that before you do anything in a prayer time, before you go anywhere, first I would connect with God relationally. The first thing you should do is connect with God relationally. I love it because Jesus says, our Father in heaven, our Father. He says, I, I want you to call him Father because that's like his favorite name to be called. Call him Father. And it's interesting to me because as I've kind of gotten older and talked to more people and not just talk to people, but actually listen to people. Sometimes you can talk to people, but you're not listening to people. And so as I listen to more people and they talk to me about the whole uh, God thing, people will say to me, well, pastor, hey, 
Jesus, I get Jesus. I understand Jesus. He went to the cross. I get it. He paid for my sins. I got it. Holy Spirit, I don't know. It's, there's a dove somewhere. I don't know. Like, there's a, it's something about the Holy Spirit. It's God directing my life. His, his Spirit is in me. Okay, I, I can get that. But when it comes to God as a father, pastor, I struggle with that one. I hear that more and more time. I struggle with understanding and relating to God as a father. And I always ask, well, why is that? And they'll say something to me like, well, pastor, I, I have a relationship with my earthly dad, and it wasn't too good. And so now, like, I already got this relationship with my earthly dad. I don't need another one of those relationships in my life. And so I, I'm good just, just kind of sticking to Jesus. You know, I, I got that. Holy Spirit, cool. But God the Father, I don't know if I can go there because I, I've experienced some bad things with my dad here on earth. And let me just stop here for a second and kind of take some time because I think that this is an important thing to really begin to connect with. What I've learned is that whatever our relationship here on earth with our earthly dad looks like, good, bad, or ugly, whatever that looks like, it's a natural thing for a lot of us to begin to project that imagery of ho however our relationship with our earthly dad was onto our heavenly father. Maybe you grew up in a, in a really bad situation. Maybe you grew up and, and, and dad was just very distant from you. Maybe dad didn't talk. Maybe dad was really harsh. Maybe dad was strict. Maybe dad, you know, didn't really connect with you a lot. Maybe, maybe dad wa was abusive. Maybe dad was verbally abusive. Maybe dad was physically abusive. Maybe dad left. Maybe dad abandoned you and, and married somebody else and went off in another family. Or something. I mean, there's so many different things that I could list today that maybe, maybe your dad did. And maybe you, you've seen that happen in your own life. And so now it's like, okay, yeah, I've experienced this hardship, this brokenness with my earthly dad. And now, God, you're telling me that you are a father and I'm supposed to just, just run to you and wrap my arms around you as father? I can't do that because all I see is the hurt from my past. All I see is the hurt that my dad gave me. And I can't do that to you, God, because I, I project the imagery onto God. So if my earthly dad was distant, then maybe, God, you're distant. If my earthly dad was, was angry, then God, I think you're angry. You're just up there with a white beard ready to rip your belt off and teach me something. Like, like I can't relate to you, so I'm just gonna stand at a distance from God the Father because I, keep, I, keep, I can't get beyond the imagery of how I grew up. And maybe there's some of you in this room today that say, you know what, my dad was great. My dad was awesome. I had a great dad. Like, I love my dad. But if we sat down and had a cup of coffee and talked, I bet you you would still say, you know what, there's still some things about my dad that I wish were different. I love my dad. I knew that, you know, he loved me, but there's probably some things that I still wish he, he did differently. I, I, I know my dad loved me, but he was always working, and I could never be there and connect with him. He was always on a business trip, or he was always at work, and so I know my dad loved me. He was bringing home the bacon. He was providing for our family, but I never could really connect with him. He didn't get to come to a lot of my games growing up. He didn't get to do these things. I know my dad loved me, but there were still some things that I'm missing. My dad, maybe he, yeah, I know my dad loved me, but my dad was so passive that when he came home, he just sat on the couch in front of the TV and just tuned out the family. And he was there, but he wasn't really present. And, and so I know my dad loves me. He's a good man, but I just, he never taught me anything. He never showed me how to be a, an adult. He never showed me how to uh, be a man or to be, to be loved by a man. And, and, and so I struggle with some things in my life because I know my dad loves me. He's a good guy. I think he's so great. But there's still some areas and some voids in my life that I'm missing because I never got that from my earthly father. And now I look at my heavenly father and say, well, maybe my heavenly father is a little bit too busy for me. I mean, I mean I, what about me? I got all these little problems. He's got all these things to take care of. Does he really care about all my little stuff? Or maybe he's so busy taking care of the world that he just doesn't have time for me. And, and there, whatever your situation is, whatever your 
imagery is of an earthly father that you maybe just by, by, by default kind of project that on God, whatever that is, it's still not the right imagery of your heavenly father who loves you. I, I say it all the time. I believe that we're all God's kids. Just some of us don't know it yet, that you are a son and a daughter of the living God. He loves you unconditionally. He will always be there to listen to you. He always wants to provide for your life. He always wants to hear about how your day is. He wants to connect with you. He wants to have an intimate relationship with each and every single one of you in this place today. And it doesn't matter how it looks Look like here on earth with your earthly dad. Man, God wants to do something amazing in your life if you will let him. So what I've found to do, and I've had to do this in my own life, is that if you've ever struggled connecting with God as father, as a heavenly father, then you need to allow, and I've had to do this, I've had to allow the Holy Spirit to come into my life and to heal the areas that were broken, to heal the areas that were hurt, to heal the areas that were kind of fractured. And, and how you do that, it's actually really simple. You just begin to talk to God, you begin to pray. You just say, Holy Spirit, you know, I, I struggle with connecting to God as a father. Would you help me with this? I, I, I have the imagery of my dad, my earthly dad, and I keep thinking about it this way. But God, I know you're not like that. I know you're different. So help me, God, to begin to, to, to heal in the areas of my life that I'm broken and help me to see you, God, for who you truly, truly are. I love what Romans chapter eight says. It says this, it says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Like if you're serving God out of fear, that's the wrong perspective. If you think God is up there angry at you, mad at you, that's the wrong perspective. He says, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Abba Father is a term that's like one of the most enduring terms that you can call God. It's like calling him daddy. Can you imagine like just calling God daddy? Like that's what he wants to be known to you and to him to be known by you. It's like that's what that's what he wants for us to have as a that kind of a relationship to him where like a son or a daughter runs to their dad and jumps on their lap and just hugs and kisses. Like, like that's what God wants for humanity, he wants for you, he wants for me. And if you struggle with that, I get it. But I would encourage you to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and to heal those areas that are hurting, heal those areas that are broken, and begin to see God as the heavenly father that he wants to be seen and known to you as. And then Jesus, after he said that, he kind of got walked into this other phrase. He said, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Now, hallowed is just not a word we say a lot in today's society. You know, we don't walk around and say, that's very hallowed over there. You're looking very hallowed today. I mean, we don't say that a lot in our society today, but what hallowed actually means is, is that it's actually it's to treat something as, as sacred or holy. And, and, and he says, listen, I want you to, to look at my name as holy and sacred. So number two, if you're taking notes, do it this way. After you kind of pray, connect with God relationally, worship his name. Take a little bit of time and, and just say, God, I worship your name today. I worship your name. And I love that the, God's name has all these amazing characteristics attached to it. Like, like God has a name, but it's but his name also has meaning and substance behind it. And it's whatever you're walking through, whatever you go through, God's name has a, has a place for you to, that you can grab a hold of, that you can uh, be a part of it and say, God, I'm, I'm running to your name today. I love what Proverbs chapter 18 says. It says, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. So what he means by this is he's saying, listen, God's name is literally like this amazing, strong tower that whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, whatever situation lies ahead of you, that you can run to the name of God and it's a place of safety. It's a place of security. It's a place that you can hold on to it when everything else in life may be shaking. You can hold on to the name that is above all other names. So it's important to know what some of God's names are. Like, I'm not talking about like Buddha and Allah. I'm talking about that God has a name and the characteristics that are attached to him. And I love it because one of his names is righteousness. 
One of his names is righteousness. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it talks about this idea that, that, that he who knew no sin, that's Jesus, became sin so that you and I might be the righteousness of Christ Jesus. If you've ever felt in a place where maybe you've made some mistakes, maybe you've done some stupid things and you've regretted some stuff, and, and it's like, wow, I, I just I don't like how, where I'm at. Well, God's righteousness makes you and me clean. Like you can run to God and say, God, I need your righteousness because, man, I feel like I've dirtied up my life. I've done so many stupid things. I've done so many, made so many different mistakes. But God, I thank you that, that you are the righteousness. I can come to you and you make me clean. I don't have to walk around dirty. I don't have to walk around with my sin, God, and, and the blemishes and the things of my past. But God, you make me clean. I love that about the name of God. Also, another name of God is the name sanctifier. That's another word maybe we don't say a lot right now, like sanctifier. What is that? Sanctify. Come on. Like, what is, what does that even mean? Like, I don't even know. But what I love about the, the real root of the meaning is that, that God has called you and he has set you apart. That he has set you apart. Like, like a calling from God is not just for somebody on stage in ministry, a pastor, not people leading worship. or man, You, every single one of you in this place has a call from God that he wants you to embrace. He wants you to run with and he wants you to change the world with. Like God, I want you to know that you are called and you are set apart, that he, he has something special for you to do in this world. And if you grab a hold of it, you'll find the meaning of life that you've been looking for, your, maybe your whole life, when you begin to see, God, I get it. I know why I am on this planet. You've called me and you've set me apart. But I love another name of God. His, his other name is Healer. His name is literally healer. And I know that sometimes in life we struggle with this one, especially if maybe you've seen somebody get sick or go through a, a, a battle medically and, and maybe it didn't turn out the way that you wanted to. But listen, I believe with all my heart that God's name is healer. He still heals today. God still works miracles today. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen God do exceedingly more than I can ever hope. Or imagine God's name is healer. He can heal situations that seem broken. God can do these things in our own life. But I love another name. It's provider. God's name is provider. Like if you're walking through something in your life and you're like, I don't know uh, how I'm going to get through tomorrow. I don't know where that next sale is going to come from. I don't know where my next job is going to come from. I don't know what that next meal is going to come from. I don't know how I'm going to pay my mortgage or rent this next week. Listen, God's name is provider, and you can run to his name and say, God, I need you to provide. I'm, I'm lost. I don't know what to do. God, I need you to provide for my life, and his name is provider. It's that strong tower that you can run to. But another name of God is the banner of victory. I love this one, banner of victory. I just think about these big banners. I don't know, like what is that banner of victory? Well, well, I love it because it shows me that there are a lot of times in life that the enemy, the devil, he wants to have a plan for your life. He wants to take you out. He wants to distract you. He wants to lead you away from God's plan. But God, his name is banner of victory, meaning that when the devil comes against you and tries to take you out, that God will raise a banner of victory over your life that you can hold on to and say, listen, I'm not going down on this one. God, I, I know that there's victory lies in your name. I'm grabbing on to the victory that is in Christ Jesus. And I understand that whatever I'm walking through right now, I'm going to see victory on the other side because his name is victory. I love that about the name of God. Another name of God is the name Shepherd. Like Shepherd, like have you ever been a, a place in your life where you did not know where to go? You did not know what to choose. You didn't know if I should turn to the left or to the right. I didn't know if I should take this job or that job. I didn't know if I should, you know, date this person or that person. And like all these different things. Move into this house or, or sell this place. Like I don't know. But I love it that God's name is Shepherd and he will lead you. And he will guide your life if you let him. God, I need you today. I don't know what to do. I need you to be my shepherd today. And then I love this other name is the name of peace. That God's name is peace. You may be in a storm. You may be walking through a difficult season of your life. But God's name is peace. And he can give you peace 
in the middle of any situation. He can give you peace in the middle of any storm. And whatever you're walking through, whatever you're feeling, whatever you're experiencing, man, you can call on the name of God. God, I need your peace today because I'm really struggling. My emotions are going everywhere. My mind, my anxiety, everything's going everywhere. God, I need peace today. And I love it that he'll give you peace in the middle of any situation where all of a sudden people can look at you and say, why aren't you freaking out right now? Like, you should be going crazy. Like, what's going on? Things in your life, oh my goodness. And you can say, I don't understand, but I just have the peace of God on me. I know everything's going to be okay because I have God's peace. I love it that we can worship the names of God. And then Jesus went into the next part and he says this. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I, I love this because he's, he's saying, hey, before you get to your requests, I know you got some requests, but before you get to your requests and the things that you need me to do in your life, I want you to think about what, 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 what my will and that my kingdom come and my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if you're taking notes, write it down this way. Before you get to your agenda, number three, pray his agenda first. Pray God's agenda first. Before you get into your agenda, say, God, I want to pray your agenda. And the question is then to be asked of, what is God's agenda? Like, what is God, what is on his prayer list for today? And when I look through the scriptures, when I look through the Bible, I can see God's prayer list, his agenda, very clearly. And it's summarized in one word, and it's the word people. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that you and I, that people may come to know him. That people, God cares about people. God loves people. Listen, people are the only thing that goes to heaven. God loves people. He wants to make a difference in people's lives. He wants to reach people. Like I said earlier, we're all God's kids. Just some of us don't know it yet. So what's on the heart and the mind of a father in heaven? The kids that aren't really around him yet. The kids who maybe are lost and are doing life and they're, they're separated from knowing that there's a God in heaven who loves them, who created them, wants to give them good things, wants to give them life to the fullest. That's on the heart and the mind of God. So pray for others. Pray that other people may know him. Pray that, that God would lead your life and lead you to come face to face in contact with somebody who needs to know that there's a God in heaven who loves them. When I talk to people too, sometimes they'll say things like to me, well, pastor, I think that's great and all, but there's just so many people in this world. How can I make a difference? Like, there's so many people in my family. There's so many people in my work. So many people in my neighborhood. Like, it just seems overwhelming. I don't know who to talk to. I don't know who to reach out to. i just rather stay at home sometimes. Like, really, do I, does God really care about other people? Absolutely, he does. And you can make a difference. I heard this story a long time ago about this older man was sitting on the beach, probably somewhere around in Florida somewhere, and the tide had kind of gone out, and the, the tide had brought in all these, like, thousands and thousands of starfish. And they kind of got washed up onto the shore, and the tide rescinded, and now all these starfish were just stranded on the beach. And this old man is looking at these starfish, he goes, I can't believe it. There's thousands on the beach today. I can't believe the number of them. There's, there's no way. All these starfish are going to die. I can't believe this is crazy. Man, this is such a sad scene. And then pretty soon, this young little boy, probably like a middle school student, comes like walking down, just whistling, got his headphones on, listening to, you know, Taylor Swift or somebody, I don't know. And, uh, and all of a sudden, this, this little boy picks up a starfish, and he looks at it, and he kind of just does a frisbee toss right back into the ocean with this starfish. And he goes a little bit further, picks up another one, kind of looks at it, does the same thing, just kind of whips it in there, you know, ultimate frisbee right back into the ocean. And this old man looks at this boy and he's like, what is this kid doing? And he stands up and he says, son, you know, what are you doing? Like, do you really think that you can make a difference and help all these starfish? Like, there's thousands of them. There, there's just so many starfish. Do you really think you can make a difference here? And the little boy picks up another starfish. He looks at it, looks at the old man, just kind of throws it back into the ocean and says, well, I just made a difference in that one's life. 
And, and listen, that's what I want you to get. There may be tons of people that are surrounding your life who don't know God. There may be tons of people at your work. There may be tons of people all over your neighborhood. But listen, if you make a difference in one person's life, then you have made a difference. And don't look, sell yourself short. That man, if you make a difference, if you impact one person, you're making a huge impact in somebody's life that's making a difference for the kingdom of God. So keep praying for people. Keep praying for your lost loved ones. Keep praying for people in your neighborhood. Keep praying Praying for people at your work. Don't stop praying for people because, listen, people that are not with God, people that are not connected with God yet, that is on the heart of God, and we see it all throughout the Bible. I love this, and I love what Matthew 6, says. It says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things you've been worried about and all your other requests. He goes, man, uh, they will be given to you as well. But focus in on his agenda first before you pray for your own, say, God, what do you, who do you want me to pray for today? God, who do you want me to interact with today that I can show the love of God to this person, that, I, that they can see that there's a God in heaven who loves them? And then the next thing that Jesus gets on to is he, he gets to the next part. And he says, give us this day our daily bread. This is where he gets to the next part. And this is where we begin to ask God. We can present our request to him and ask him to, for help, ask him for things. And God, this is what I'm walking through. This is what I'm, I'm needing right now. This is what I'm, I'm going through. And what I think one of the biggest mistakes that we can make in our life is we can say, well, you know what, God? I really don't need anything. I'm good. I'm good. I don't really need anything. I, my life's pretty good. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that we can make because, listen, I don't know about you, but... But life will throw a lot of things at you. And I need God's wisdom. I need God's grace. I need God's ability every day. And, and I can't do it in my own strength, my own ability. I need God every single day to be successful in this life. And when I ever try to do it on my own strength, it's a failure all the time, 100%. Like, I need God's presence in my life. I need God directing me. And so write it down this way. Number four, depend on him for everything. I give God everything. Depend on him for everything. Stop trying to do life in your own strength, in your own wisdom, your own ideas. Say, God, I need you. I need you to help me in this situation. I need you to help me in my marriage. I need you to help me with my kids. I need you to help me in my job. I need you to help me with my health. I need you to help me in all these different areas. And I love it because Psalms 121 says this, I look to the mountains. Does my help come from there? Absolutely not. My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and earth. He says, listen, I'm not looking to them. I'm not looking to any other source for my help. I'm looking to God because he's the only one who is able to help me. He's the only one who can, he made the heavens and the earth I, and I can go to him. I'm going to him today because I need him every single day. Then the next thing that Jesus got into is he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So here, here, here's a big part. He, goes, he says, listen, I, I, need to, I need you to forgive me, God, for some of the things I've done. But I also, I want to forgive those who have, who have hurt me. I need, to, I need to forgive the people in my life that maybe have said some things, done some things, and I'm walking around with the pain of the past. God, I, I, I want to forgive. I want you to forgive me, and I need to forgive others. So write it down this way. Number five, if you're taking notes, get your heart right with God and with others. Get your heart right with God and others. And I do this every day almost. I'm like, God, if there's anything in my life that is, like, that is, that is hindering my relationship with you, God, would you point it out to me? God, I don't want anything in my life that is distracting me, that is keeping me from an intimate relationship with you, God. God, if there's anything in my life that I need to change, I'm, I'm submitting to you because, God, I know you know what's best for my life. I got some ideas. I got some things. But, God, if they're not healthy for me, if they're not good for me spiritually, God, I submit my ways to your ways. And, God, point out some things in my life that I need to change. And then at the same time, I'll say, God, if there's anybody in my life that I'm holding a grudge against, that I'm, I'm angry at, that I'm hurt from, 
Would you point that out to me as well, God, so I can forgive them, so I can release that, and so I can experience true freedom and true joy once again. I think one of the biggest things that a lot of us, while we don't experience joy, while we don't experience freedom that Christ talks about, is because we are, we are, con we are continually locking ourselves in a prison of unforgiveness. Now, I'm not going to forgive that person. They did me wrong. They hurt me. They said this. They did that behind my back. They stabbed me in the back. I'm not going to forgive them. And listen, a lot of times that person has moved on and we're the one that's holding on to the, the unforgiveness. But when you begin to forgive other people, you're actually not letting them out of a jail, but you're letting yourself out of a jail and you're finding the freedom that God has for you. So I encourage you today that if there's anybody in your life that maybe has done you wrong and you need to release to God, do it and you will experience something that you've never experienced maybe before, and it's the joy and the freedom that you're really looking for. But then Jesus gets into this next part. He says, hey, and do not lead us into temptation. Do not lead us into temptation. Now, this is actually kind of a bad translation because God does not lead people into temptation. Actually, the Greek, with the original Greek was written in, a better translation would probably be, don't allow me to be led into temptation. So what this really means is that, let me break it down to you in Pastor Jason uh, verge, ver, verbiage, is that you know, there's going to be moments in our day where temptation is on the, the calendar. There's going to be a moment every single day of our lives where the devil is going to want to say, I'm going to tempt them. I want to tempt them with something. And so what he's saying in this prayer is, hey, God, when I get to that temptation, when I get right up to that moment where I have, I have to choose and make a choice, God, help me make the right decision. Help me to make the right decision. Do I, do I go here? Do I do that? Do I look at this? Do I not look at that? Do I say this in that moment or do I not say this? God, there's going to be a moment where temptation is on the calendar today. But God, when I get to that moment, help me make the right decision decision, God. Help me stay strong. Help me fight against what the enemy has to, wants to do in my life and help me to be the person you've called me to be. I love what Ephesians chapter 6 says. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You may say, Pastor, that, count, that sounds a little too Star Wars for me. I don't know if I'm into that. Like, that sounds a little bit too sci-fi. I don't know if I, if I like that. Is this a lot of spiritual forces in this world? Like, really? Well, you may not understand it. You may not like it. You may not even want to talk about it, but that doesn't mean it's not real. That the enemy of your soul, the devil, constantly wants to come against you, berate you, wants to distract you, wants to tempt you. And that what we do, the Bible talks about, is that we engage, number six, if you're taking notes, engage in spiritual warfare, that we can engage in a battle that is spiritual, and that the way we do that is simply through the prayers that we're praying. A lot of times people are like, well, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not, I'm a lover, not a fighter. You know, I don't want to, can we just talk about the love of God? Can we, can we not, I don't want to fight, pastor, like the devil, like that, isn't that God's job? Well, absolutely, but we can take our stand against the enemy and to pray prayers of faith. And what I do all the time is, listen, like, like I, I'm, I'm going to pray, I'm going to fight for my family. And if I got to pray spiritually and pray, God, I pray that you would protect my marriage. I, I pray that you protect my wife. I pray that, that my wife and I would love each other more today than we did yesterday, but not as much as tomorrow. And then, God, I, would, I pray that you would be with me and help my kids to grow up to be strong men and women of God. God, I, I pray that you would protect their lives, God. And as they go into school, God, help them make good friendships and people that are going to build them up that are lifelong friends. God, I, I pray for my job. I pray for these things in my life. I pray for my family. Like, like we can engage in spiritual warfare and pray for these things. And, and, and it's like we are fighting a battle. Like, and it's, it, the battle is not that person that drives you crazy, by the way. 
The battle is not your neighbor when their neighbor's dog and how crazy they are or that person at work that's always trying to stab you in the back. And your problem is not your mother-in-law or somebody in your family that just drives you crazy. Like, like that's not what your battle is against. The Bible says clearly that our battle is against these spiritual things that are trying to distract us, to keep us from the person that God is ultimately calling us to be. But you don't have to sit there and just be passive that you can engage in a spiritual warfare where you can begin to pray in the name above all other names. And I love it. At the sound of his name, like en the enemy has to scatter. Like at the sound of the name of Jesus, the enemy goes running. It says in the Bible that the enemy scatters and sh shakes and trembles at the name of Jesus. And you can pray that over your situation, your life, whatever you're walking through. And, and you are engaging in spiritual warfare. And then Jesus kind of wraps it all up. And he says this at the end. He says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. I love that because he's kind of wrapping it up with this like, this really like this excited part. He goes, he's like, come on, like, like we're, we're getting excited. We're wrapping this up, but we are declaring God's ability to do exceedingly more than I could ever hope or imagine. What I love about this one is that everything that you prayed in your prayer, no matter what you're walking through, None of it intimidates God, by the way. Like nothing you pray, God's like, ooh, that's too big for me. I don't know about that. Nothing you pray ever intimidates God. And I love what number seven, I put this down. So wrap it up this way. Express faith in God's ability. Express faith in the God that created the heavens and the earth. That whatever you're walking through, whatever you're hurt from, whatever you need to happen in your life, man, God is able and willing to do exceedingly more than you could ever hope or imagine. I love what Jeremiah 32 says. It says this, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing, I mean nothing, is too hard for you. No matter what you're up against, I'm out of a job, I got a bad medical diagnosis, uh, I'm, my family is estranged, like my kids are not with me right now, like there's a lot of hurt in my life. Like, whatever you're walking through, whatever you're going through, my marriage is falling apart. Man, God, I pray these things and I express faith in your ability, God, that Lord, you can do anything, God. And I give you my life, I surrender my life to you, and I know that, God, that you can turn anything into good. You can turn any bad situation into a good situation because, God, you're the God of miracles. You're the God of more than enough. God, you love me. I'm one of your kids, and I can come to you boldly and talk to you as one talks to their father because, God, you want me to connect to you that way. You want to have an intimate relationship with me. You don't want me to stand at a distance because you're not standing at a distance. I can come to you. I can call you daddy. I can run to you. And everything I lay out to you today, God, it doesn't intimidate you. You actually love it when I pray some pretty big prayers. You love it when I, when I pray some prayers where I can get beyond some hurdles in my life and experience all that you have for me. Like, I think God it loves it when we do those things and begin to express the faith, our faith in his ability. So here's, that's kind of the Lord's prayer, how I believe that we can take something that maybe some of us recited a lot in our life or you've heard it, but when you break it down and begin to see the parts that Jesus was breaking it down so we can incorporate into our life. Listen, I believe with all my heart, you can take this into your daily routine and you can feel like, wow, I'm connecting with God in a way that I've never connected with him because I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm making progress. I'm, I'm connecting with God in an intimate way and I'm viewing things so much differently. And I love it because of what Jesus did on the cross. What Jesus did, now you and I can come to him and begin to talk to him and call him Abba Father. He's not standing at a distance. He's not got a big white beard with a belt out. He actually wants you to run and jump on his lap and embrace him because that's how he wants to be seen by you. That's our Heavenly Father. This is the Lord's prayer. If we could stand today as we close this message.